following are accounts of park rangers, both local and state, from all around the United States, about strange happenings they've experienced while on the job. Some accounts are extremely graphic and grisly. Listener discretion is advised. Case 1. Washington. I just wanted to say thank you for your time. Please state your full name, and then proceed to tell us your story from your view. Feel free to get as detailed as necessary. Hello. My name is Jim D. Winters, and I work for the Park Rangers. On this particular date, 3rd of May, 2012, I... It's okay, Jim. Take your time. Well, John, I guess the best way to put it to you, and anyone who hears this, I'm quite sure I met someone who is dead. I was working my normal patrol, and was at the time assigned around Federation Forest State Park. We saw all manners of things. Naked homeless folk, occasional people going missing, sometimes we'd find drug deals going on. But nothing was quite like this. It really began a couple days before, when some folks told us they had saw a woman wandering around the forest, catatonic. They would follow her, and eventually she'd disappear. The description was a red-haired woman, with pale skin, blue eyes, and a torn white dress. We put together a search team and went looking for ourselves. I was the lead on that team for the rangers. We searched day and night and didn't seem to find or see anyone. Now, by the third, we begun to believe this woman could very well be dead. Another part of the description given about her was that she seemed to be scarred and bleeding quite a bit. That's the part that was so strange though. We went out to where she was supposedly seen and there was no blood to be found. The park closes at around dusk and normally we don't work nights. But I decided I'd stick around and do my own search that night. It is about 9 p.m. when I hear a voice while patrolling the forest. It was very distinct and sounded like a young woman. Help me! That's what I heard. Then, while I looked for the person behind the voice, I heard it again. There, standing upon a hill was a woman, shaking, bleeding, and she fit the description given by the passerby the other day to a T. I naturally go up to this young woman, but as I do, she turns and begins walking away. I of course call out to her, telling her I want to help her and I'll lead her back to the station and we'll take things from there. I get to the top of the hill and she's gone. I'm talking vanished. I'm slowly moving my flashlight through the forest when I hear her voice again. Help me, she says. I look further ahead and she's walking west from behind a tree. I rush on over and repeat to her who I am, who I work for, and that I'd like to help her. I get to the trees where she is and, just as I'm about to catch up to her, she goes around a tree. Next thing I know, I turn and she's gone. Help me! The voice calls once again from further away now. Now at this point, nothing is making sense to me. I'm starting to feel pretty uneasy myself, but this young woman clearly needs my help, and so I keep following her voice and continue my pursuit of her. Help me! Again, I hear her voice, and again, I continue deeper into the forest. I'm very well versed in the area, and I'm not worried about being lost, but this poor girl, I'm beginning to notice she seems to look more and more wounded every single time I see her. Finally, after she vanishes again, I hear her voice and continue out into a clearing. Upon arriving there, I see her crying. Now, you gotta understand, this woman went from partially bleeding to near ripped to shreds, bleeding heavily, and now her face is nearly unrecognizable. Crying uncontrollably, I see her lift a finger, which I can see the bone through some of the cuts on her hand now, and point down. Help me! She keeps crying, and as she does, she grows more desperate and afraid. She's shaking uncontrollably at this point, 
and as I get closer I can see the wound she has. She appears to be... stabbed. I'm just about to reach the young lady when my foot hits something. There's a bit of a crunch as I look down towards my feet. You gotta understand where I am now. It isn't on any path or anywhere near where anybody would be visiting the park. Pulling some leaves and debris out of the way, I see something sticking out of the ground. And to my shock and horror, it appears to be a skeletal finger. I, I did carefully but quickly. Now, and what do I find? A corpse in a tattered white dress, dried blood all over it. I call the local authorities and explain I found what I believe is the corpse of a woman we've been searching for. It isn't until later it really sets in. What I saw was the ghost of this poor young woman. She was trying to lead someone to her body. I was in shock and I've never experienced anything like it. I kept this pretty close to Vest at first. Eventually, though, I did try to tell some close colleagues of mine how I actually found the body. You could imagine some of the reactions. Most of them I'd known for a while, so they wanted to believe me. But, I mean, you try to explain to anyone you found a murder victim because their ghost led you to them and see how their reaction will be. At any rate, we did get enough forensics to find the killer eventually, and she is behind bars now, for life. It was the young woman's best friend, could you imagine, betrayed by someone you trusted the most. The murder was savage. It was personal. When you asked why she did it, she'd only say the bitch deserved it. Hearing that just really pissed me off. What could she have possibly done to deserve that? There were no hints or clues as to what went down between them. No guy, nothing to suggest that they were fighting. Personally, I believe the best friend was just evil. She probably never truly cared about her friend. But why wait 15 years before murdering someone? <sighs> I suppose we'll never truly know. Case 2, Texas. Thank you so much for your time. Please state your name and proceed to give us your story. My name is Gavin R. West, and I work for the Park Rangers. It was 1990, and I was working at Lost Maple State Natural Area, and the area surrounding it. You're told some things when you first come on as a park ranger at any park. People have stories about ghosts, local legends, stuff like that. I didn't really believe any of that until July of 1990. I'd come on as a park ranger, replacing a man who I learned was missing. This was a topic of debate among many of the rangers, as many of them were considering the guy odd, but still a good friend. The man in question was named Jonathan Williams, and his disappearance is still unsolved to this day. It was probably my third month on the job, and I'd gotten pretty used to it. I'd helped out people when they went missing, but I'd also patrol the parks, help preserve the natural wildlife and habitat. The area I worked in was more about preserving the park and its beauty and less about missing persons. On this particular morning, I remember going out to make some rounds, make sure no one was doing anything they weren't supposed to be, and that anyone that shouldn't be there was removed from the park. That sort of thing was rare back then, but you'd occasionally get a homeless guy or gal that tried to make the park their home. It was while making the rounds that I saw something off. It appeared to be some sort of writing. I couldn't read it, and it almost looked like red paint was used to write it. Assuming someone was committing vandalism, I proceeded to take a few pictures and prep a report. As I continued taking pictures, I noticed more of these symbols and strange writings, as well as streaks of what I believed to be paint, leading deeper into the park. Eventually, I found myself near some cliffs, and this is where I found a body ripped to shreds. It was the most disgusting and disturbing thing I had ever seen in my life. Looking around, I saw a wolf in the distance. It simply stared my way and didn't think much of it because nature and, you know. I report the body, and we investigated the cause of death. It appeared to have been ripped to pieces by some sort of animal. Perhaps maybe the wolf I saw. There was a problem, however. You see, 
The heart was missing from the body. An animal could have taken it, of course, but the way the organs were displayed almost seemed to suggest that the murder was planned. The organs were splayed out in a manner to suggest a pentagram, and the way they were displayed didn't seem like something an animal would be capable of. We closed the park while we investigated further, and eventually we found a staging area. There were rocks and more strange symbols in the red paint, which turned out to be blood. In the center of a pentagram, made of sticks and circled in salts, there sat the victim's heart. Turning away from the scene, I looked into the distance and saw a wolf. I couldn't be certain, but it seemed like the same one. Turning towards the animal's direction, I began walking after it. As I did, it quickly turned and darted off into the woods. I thought it was strange, but continued walking in the direction. As I got deeper into the woods, I noticed the wolf's paw prints. They'd gone on for about another hundred feet, when things suddenly took a strange turn. The wolf paw prints were suddenly human feet. I took photos and continued following the tracks until out of the blue, the tracks vanished altogether. I looked for any sign of anything and anyone and did not find it. I eventually headed back to the station and made my report on the matter. A few weeks went by and the park reopened at this point, and the mystery behind the dead body we found still laid without any answers. The media had jumped every conclusion imaginable, from a cult to some demon out of the forest. It only served to add to the popularity of the area, of course. One Friday morning I got up, headed to work, and saw some of my colleagues waiting for me. They looked to be in a state of shock, and when I asked them what had happened, they took a moment before telling me they'd seen someone swear that, that Jonathan Williams was there. I was going to dismiss it until they showed me a picture they'd taken of the man, and then showed me a comparison of the one of the old photographs of him. The resemblance was striking, and we were at a loss. The ranger said he tried to speak to his former colleague, but they only turned and bolted. Apparently, they moved fast because he said he'd barely blinked when the man was almost out of sight, whereas a few seconds before, he was a few feet in front of them when he took the photo. We reported our findings, and after our initial search, we found nothing that would help. The photograph is displayed to this day in the station. No other sighting of the man has been reported since, and we never solved the murder of the Jane Doe I'd found my round years ago either. I'm not sure if it's a cult or some kind of unknown species, but let me tell you this. Something strange is going on out there. Case 3. New Jersey. Please state your full name and tell us your story. We'd like to thank you in advance for your time. My name is Jack D. Clarkson, and I work for the State Park Rangers here in New Jersey. It's not a secret we have plenty of strange happenings and missing persons. That sort of thing around here happens a lot. We have local legends, and one of the most popular is, of course, the Jersey Devil. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not here to tell you about the Jersey Devil. No, I'm here to tell you about something completely unexplainable and stranger than that. I'm calling it the Echoes. You might be telling yourself, what's so strange about an echo? Allow me to further elaborate for y'all. It was August of 2014, and I was at the station near High Point State Park. It was late, and we were closed, but I decided to work on some things off the clock, late into the night. There I am, catching up on some writing reports about vandalism and repairs that needed to be made to park benches, etc., when my radio comes to life. There's a laughter coming from it. I picked up the radio and chuckled to myself, asking who's on the other end and trying to prank me. Again, only a low laughter in response. I couldn't quite make out if it was a male or a female, but there was definitely a laughter on the other end. Come on, whoever's on the other end, you can quit joking around. I wait. Then the response is more laughter, but this time it is less playful and sounds like it is multiple people. Seriously, who is over there? Stop playing around. I'm all for 
joking, but y'all know this station isn't for playing around. Silence. I go back to my paperwork when suddenly I am jolted by the sound of a loud bang on the front door of the station. Shit! I said out loud as I headed for the door. I'd spilled my coffee into my paperwork and would need to restart my latest report as a result. Pissed off, I rip open the door only to find nothing. There was no one there. No one near the door or anything. I did a quick search around the station and found nothing. As soon as I went back, inside and locked the door and cleaned up the mess I had made, started a new report, I rode away when I heard the laughter coming from the radio again. The radio was more distorted and almost sounded half like laughing and half like crying after a few more minutes. The radio fell silent and two more large bangs came from the outside of the door. I jumped in, fed up decided to grab a weapon, a flashlight and headed out of the station. Opening the door was nothing, locking the door behind me, I continued looking around until I heard a scream. I turned and rushed into the forest. As I can hear, more screaming. I couldn't quite tell where it was coming from until I heard the sound of voices crying from further inside the forest. Without hesitation, I followed the echoes until eventually I found a cave. Inside was a woman. She was bleeding next to a fire and I rushed to help her. She was crying, struggling to breathe and I immediately called the authorities and waited with the woman. Eventually, the EMT and the cops showed up and brought the young lady to the hospital. It took a month or so, but outside of some scars, she made a full recovery. Upon giving her side of what happened, the woman spoke about a man who'd stalked her while she jogged. He'd eventually caught up with her and knocked her out. Shortly after she awoke, she said he cut on her and tortured her. She said she could still remember the whole thing, and she could remember his laughter. The woman was also shocked that she had been found. She said she screamed and cried, but the louder she cried, the louder the man laughed. I did eventually compare my story with hers, and she seemed at a loss, as was I. I only came because I heard laughter and crying all over my radio, which soon continued into the woods. The strangest part about all of this, she wasn't near a radio, and there was no way the voices I heard on the radio were hers or her killers. A couple more months went by and I found a man, clawed open and dead in the park. He was identifiable, but his stomach had been ripped open and a huge claw mark was on his face. DNA and a personal identification by his would-be victim, the woman I'd saved, would reveal that he was the woman's attacker that night. I'm not sure what led me to the woman, but I'm grateful I found her and I'm grateful to the things I call the echoes for leading me to this young lady before it was too late. I'll probably never have definitive answers about what was speaking through the radio or the forest to get my attention and lead me to the young woman I saved, but I'm grateful regardless. Case 4 Montana Begin whenever you feel ready. My name is Darren J. Wendell, and I believe I am ready to speak about the things I experienced on the night of December 5th, 2002 in Ackley Lake State Park. I used to work for the park rangers, and to this day, have never experienced what I witnessed that night. I wasn't on duty when it happened, but having been rather used to hanging around this park and sometimes camping, I took my family out for what was supposed to be a night of relaxation under the stars. Sadly, this isn't how this ends. <sighs> Are you sure you're okay with sharing your story? We don't have to do this if you don't wish to. Or we can reschedule for another time if need be. No, no. People need to know the truth. People need to know what the hell is going on out there. I'll admit, I wasn't exactly camping where people might normally. I, being a park ranger for 20 years at the time, knew the ins and outs of the state park, the lake, as well as any of the surrounding areas. So my family and I camped away from the public in a little area I'd scouted out and we'd camped in previously. It started out wonderfully. It was cold, but we were well prepared with a fire, some hot dogs, and marshmallows. 
and the casual camping stuff, like tents and creepy tales of things that supposedly happened around the park late at night. The tales we shared weren't real, of course. The one I'm sharing with you now, I wish wasn't either. I say it was about 10 or 11 p.m. by the time we decided to put out the fire and sleep for the night. At approximately 1 in the morning, I awoke to the sound of screaming. I shot up and immediately went outside to find my 8-year-old daughter and 7-year-old son staring at a deer hanging open and blood pouring out from the tree. The thing looked as though it had been turned inside out and the sight was appalling. Scared for my children, we decided to pack up as quickly as possible and begin to trek back to the car to head home. As we arrived back on the proper trail, we froze in place at the sight of strange entities wearing deer skulls and black robes standing around us. Startled, I pulled out a gun and told them to move. I didn't know what sick shit these people or things were into, but I was going to not to have any part of that shit. It was shortly after that that I saw them beginning to vibrate and things got really dizzy. I heard my wife and kids crying and then I passed out. When I woke up, it was about 3 in the morning, and my family was nowhere in sight. I was left on the trail alone. Pa panicking, frantically calling out for my family, there was nothing. I ran everywhere, looking for any sign of them, scrambling to find any clues as to where they went. I found nothing still. I was scared, alone, and desperate as I continued my search. Uh, eventually... Eventually, I heard a dripping sound from the trees above me. Looking up, I saw my wife, or, or what was left of her. She'd been skinned alive, and I was only able to identify her by her wedding band. Continuing my search, I found a heavy blood trail leading further away, towards the lake itself. It was here I found my son's body. He was burned alive. I didn't have the hearts or the will to press much further. I tried calling the police, but I, I couldn't get a signal. I remember feeling sick to my stomach, even throwing up a few times before I heard another scream. It was my daughter's voice. God, Mabel. I, I thought to myself, please be alive. You know how they say, be careful what you wish for, you, you might just get it. Well, she was alive, at least for a bit. She was standing near the lake when I noticed something around her waist. I ran towards her, and just as I reached her, it was then that I saw her eyes were missing. She, she said, Daddy, why can't I see? Daddy, help me, please. And then just like that, she was ripped into the lake, and I dove in immediately and swam, looking off, and as soon as I could, but I found nothing. No one. It was too dark to see, and it was only after hours of searching it hit me. That the lake wasn't frozen. It seemed odd. It was almost six when I realized the sky seemed dark. I couldn't see the moon or the stars. There was an eerie dread that hung in the air. As I was about to give up my search coming up for air, I noticed these strange figures with skulls standing around the center of the lake. They, they, they looked towards the sky, and I felt the nauseating vibration occur again. Looking up towards the sky now, I saw something that made even less sense than everything that had happened to this point. To this day, I'm positive I saw it, but part of me still wants to believe I was seeing things. In the sky above, space opened, and I saw a giant eye stare down at the lake below. I remember the nauseating, fading, and distinct fear overtaking me. The next feeling I know, I was awoken by police on the edge of the lake. They said they got a call about a naked man laying on the side of the lake. They took me to a county for processing, then spoke with me about what happened. They didn't believe the things I told them, and I mean could you blame them? They asked me about my family and what, what happened to them. I told them everything. It was pointless, but I, I tried anyways. After a while in lockup and a long investigation, they eventually found nothing linking me to the missing family or 
anything that could stick at least. I was let out, but forced to do community service for public indecency. I of course retired from the rangers after that. A forced retirement. One I would have taken regardless. There's never been any further evidence of what might have happened to my family or any things that I told the police that I saw. I'm pretty much considered the local crazy now, and my life is ruined. But I know what I saw out there and I know what happened. I have no clue why my family was murdered or why I was spared, but there are things out there that I can't explain or imagine. I'm sorry, I can't speak on this any further. Additional notes on case four. After hearing Darren's claims, I have to admit, even I had a hard time believing them. So, I decided to dig a little deeper into his story and ask some of the locals and law enforcement what they thought. As should be no surprise, most people did think him crazy. That being said, the surprising majority of those I asked did not believe Darren had anything to do with his family's disappearance. They said, up until whatever happened to his family, he was a very loving, caring man, who the community respected, and overall he and his family were very well loved. I realize that Darren's case isn't about someone who saw something strange on the job as a park ranger, like the other stories to this point have been. But, upon reading about his story online and realizing he was still a park ranger when everything happened, I thought it'd be important to include his story with the other's cases presented. It is easily the strangest of the stories I've interviewed for this cast, but there's another, even stranger one that would much of this world is familiar with, and I will investigate further in a future episode. That story is none other than the mystery surrounding a certain park ranger who burned down a forest in Bienville, as well as some new mysteries cropping up around the area. Why did Tim burn the forest down? What do the people of Bienville believe actually happened? Also, and possibly more importantly, why is it only a month or so after a fire that ravaged a town and burned its woods to the ground, have the same woods recovered 25%? These are questions I'll tackle along with several other mysteries in future episodes, but stay tuned as I give my final thoughts on the mysteries presented in this episode, and give you a preview of the next episode. My final thoughts on these cases. If there's one thing this episode shows, it is the strange things that are happening more and more in these parks and forests around the nation. Case 1 presented the ghost of a woman who simply wanted to be found, out in Washington. Is this proof of ghosts? If so, how does that change our understanding of what we believe we know about the world today? Case 2 brought us to Texas, where an unsolved murder and the seeming reappearance of a missing park ranger left more questions than answers. Was it really the park rangers? Is there a cult out there? Is this some kind of shapeshifter? Could it be something else altogether? Next was Case 3, up in New Jersey where a park ranger has told us about what he dubs the Echoes, a series of mysterious audio mimickings that led to a life being saved out in the woods. What were these voices? Is there some sort of guardian spirit out there protecting certain souls wandering in the wilderness? What is it, and was it what killed the killer who stalked those woods? Could it be the past victims who died in the forest, or is it truly a single entity? Finally, we have case 4, which I honestly am not sure what to make of. While interviewing Darren, I feel he was telling the truth, but is his truth really what he believes it to be? I can't think of many reasons he would dream up what he did, and it's very clear he believes his own story. We have wound up in parallel universes before, at least so we have read about, so maybe that could be it. The more I think about it, the less sense it makes. Perhaps, some things will forever remain a mystery. I'd like to thank everyone who listened to this first episode of the Creep Factor podcast, Strange Things I've Seen as a Park Ranger series. My name is John Billigan, and I hope you will stay with us as we delve deeper into these mysteries and more in future episodes. Next episode, we investigate possible demonic activity in Delaware, strange disappearances in Arizona, a possible close encounter with Bigfoot in Oregon, 
And finally, the strange case of a park in Alabama where people believe the weather is sentient. Have a safe night, everyone. And remember, you are never truly low. Hello, my friends. I hope you're safe and well tonight. This is the Creep Factor Podcast. And my name, of course, is John Billigan. Tonight, we have episode two of our special on strange things Park Ranger saw on the job. And boy, do we have some interesting stories tonight. Before we get to that, though, I want to ask for your opinion. What do you think of this podcast and this special? The reason I ask is that I got some pretty warm reception during the previous special, and we were thinking of making this a regular, more frequent staple of the podcast, I guess you could say. Love it? Hate it? Let me know as I always love to hear from you. Comment down below. So tonight's first story comes from a park ranger in Delaware by the name of Dana Hanley. Listen closely viewers as she tells us her experiences around Clay Creek State Park. My name is Dana Hanley, and I've been working as a park ranger for roughly five years now. This experience happened in my second year as a ranger, so back in 2014, around May I want to say. I was just reporting in for my shift when I was alerted to the fact there was a decapitated deer near the creek. I know, a wonderful way to start your shift in the morning, right? Anyways, I went out and helped clean everything up. We weren't quite sure why this deer had been decapitated or who had done it, but it was obvious it was meant to be seen as there was a stick with the head stuck on it like a pike. One of the thoughts that crossed my mind was that this could have been some kind of ritual, but as time went on, it got stranger. We cleared the body and let people back in that area of the park as soon as we were able. The rest of the day, things are fairly normal and I go home. The next morning, we find another decapitated deer, another pike, another head on said pike. At this point, we're thinking, okay, someone is probably screwing with us, but what is happening is illegal, so we decide we'll hire an off-duty officer to kind of patrol the park at night. Another night goes by, and this time, when I report to my shift, I head out to check on the officer. He tells me he didn't see anything on patrol, so I tell him thanks and head back to the station. I'm the first person in that morning, so unlocking the station, I head in, and what do I find? A deer head, in the middle of our break room table, and a giant eye drawn in blood. I'm gagging at this point because of the smell, and quickly call the police. They do an investigation. Look for prints, DNA, anything. Unfortunately, they came up with nothing. (laughs) I'm of course thinking, naturally, that's what would happen because I'm not sickened or creeped the fuck out enough yet, right? It gets stranger though. We checked the footage and we saw nothing. The deer was dragged into the room. The stuff was written in blood. But there was nothing doing this that we could see. We thought, surely, the camera is malfunctioning, but when looking at our current footage, we were all visible on the monitor. In an effort to end this, we brought on another off-duty officer to watch the park overnight and I volunteered to hang around the station and see if anything or anyone turned up. This was a mistake in my opinion. The night started off relaxed enough. For the longest time, there was nothing but quiet, the occasional sound of walkie-talkie chatter back and forth as I checked in with the officer and they checked in on me and lots of coffee being made. I want to say it was about 11.30 when I heard a large thud on the roof. I jumped as it was rather sudden, but didn't initially go out and check the roof. Five minutes later, I hear dripping and another thud. It gets quiet, but I'm curious, so I head for the door. Before I can unlock it though, I see a deer's body come swinging down and breaking through our station window. I flipped out, got on the walkie, and called the officer. It takes a couple of minutes and they arrive. Together, we both went up to the roof where we found the eye drawn in blood and the deer head above it. Now I'm at a loss at this point. I'm debating quitting my job and I'm 
freaked out. When morning comes, my boss gives me a few days off. I go home, and in time, I begin to relax. All goes well until the final night off. That night, I go to sleep peacefully enough, but upon falling asleep, I have a nightmare that even talking about it now scares me. I'm in the park. It's late at night, and I can hear a low voice. It's almost a growling. Nothing being said makes sense. Eventually, I start to see people in the shadows around me. They have no eyes, and they're trying to cry, but only blood is coming out. Their voices are off because they appear to have no tongues. On the wall across from me, there's an eye painted in blood. I feel terrified. There's just this odd feeling of unease and darkness. The people begin falling to the floor, some convulsing, others reaching in pain to the sky. Then I see my mom. I haven't seen my mom since I moved out of her house. She is crying, then blood pours from her body. The next thing I know, I'm hearing a growling and the blood-soaked eye on the wall appears to widen. I wake up right after that to the sound of my phone going off. It's about 3 in the morning and on the other end is a detective. He tells me my mother is dead. She was found brutally murdered. She called 911 but by the time they arrived she was dead. She had no eyes. Her tongue had been cut out. Her head was removed, sitting in her hands, and a deer head was placed where her neck was, while on the wall above her bed was an eye, painted in her blood. My mom lives about an hour from me, and we weren't the closest, but she didn't deserve what happened to her at all. To this day, that case and the strange happenings at the park are unsolved. I'm not sure what the heck was going on at our park or how it got to my mom, but I'm convinced it wasn't human. I kept my job as park ranger, though. I kept my job as a park ranger, though I did almost quit. I hoped I could find answers. I never did. The strange happenings at the park stopped. Sometimes, though, when I sleep, I see that eye in some of my dreams. Well, listeners, what do you think? Is whatever killed Dana's mother human? Some things to note that weren't addressed in her story, but... I later dug up with security footage from the night she stayed in the station at the park. At one point, it almost looks like a shadowy mass is walking around the station as she's making coffee and keeping watch. Another thing is that she's leaving the station to go home after talking to her boss. It appears like something leaves with her. Also of note was other than her mother's blood and the deer's blood, there was no real DNA evidence found at her mother's house. This all makes me believe that whatever was going on at that park followed Dana home. Why, or how it eventually made its way to her mother's, I couldn't tell you. Like most mysteries though, whether we have all the answers or not, they are likely out there somewhere. One final note I find a bit strange. The eye. What does it mean? Also, if we go back to case 4 on the previous episode, Darren said he saw a giant eye peer from the sky. Are these linked somehow? Or is it something simple, like a coincidence? Our next case takes place in Arizona, and was actually sent in to us by a park ranger by the name of Jared Mills. His story goes as follows. Case number six, Arizona. Hello John, my name is Jared Mills. I worked with the park rangers at Lost Dutchman State Park for 40 years before retiring. I apologize in advance for not being able to meet with you in person, but I'm old, not very mobile, and don't have much of a voice nowadays. At any rate, I wanted to tell you about something strange going on at my park when I work there. If memory serves me correctly, the first time I encountered what I'm calling the Arizona Vanishings was about five to seven years into my time as a park ranger. We get missing person cases out there quite a bit, and you have your fair share of people who go off out of their way, get stranded, lost, dehydrated, die, and that sort of thing. However, most of them are found in some way, manner, or form, eventually. At least, those near or around the park itself. We got a missing person case on a John Wixby 
who said he was going to hike and camp over the weekend. Well, by the time we got the report, he'd been out there roughly three days. Heading off on a search, we eventually came upon clothes, a backpack, shoes, and everything except John. The police ran DNA and it matched John. It was his gear and everything was just sitting there, in a clump, almost as though he'd been raptured or something. This was certainly strange, but in my mind, that's all it was at the time. I chalked it up to being a missing persons case we'd probably never solve. In a joint effort with local law enforcement, we searched for John for the better part of a month, but sadly, there was never a body or anything. We dug, we tried high, low, everywhere, but nothing. Eventually, we gave up on the search. A year to the day after this happened, a woman by the name of Anna Daly disappeared. We searched a week for her, until eventually, we found another spot with clothes, shoes, gear, everything, but Anna. There were no external clues, no hints as to what may have happened to her. Much like John Wixby, it was as though she just up and vanished in the thin air. What was going on? Who knew? But the local papers started speculating. Between the paper and locals, there were theories of everything from these two being spirited away, aliens taking them, to them simply going crazy from heat exhaustion and wandering off into the desert. Six months after Anna's disappearance, there was another. A man named William Hendale went hiking with his family and camping over the weekend. Some relatives reported them missing a day after they were supposed to return home, and after a couple of days of searching, we found all of their clothes and personal effects, but once again, no bodies to speak of. Keep in mind, this was a family of seven people. You don't just make seven people vanish, or it shouldn't be very easy, to say the least. At this point, tourism was growing because of the mystery. We were at a loss, of course. We'd given out the word to stay in groups and hikes and such, but a family of seven just vanished, so were groups really going to help at this point? After the Hendales' disappearance, we had a few more. One was five months from the Hendales, the other month after that, another year after that, and another three years after that. There was no rhyme or reason to the disappearances. There was no pattern, nor were there a set amount of disappearances or set time apart. It was simply baffling. In every single case, only clothes and whatever personal effects the missing had on them were there. No bodies were ever found, and no one seemed to have answers for it at all. The most recent disappearance was that of a fellow park ranger back in 2014. I was there for this one. We were searching for the park for someone who'd gone missing a week prior, a Kyle Lenahan when Mark Winslow, a 10-year veteran of our park services, went up a hill while I turned and searched further down. It'd been about 10 minutes when I decided I wasn't going to find anything where I was looking. I got on my walkie and radioed Mark to see what he had found and told him I was heading his way. We weren't that far apart to begin with. I got nothing on the radio, so I tried again. Still nothing. Heading up the hill, I reached the top when I saw all of Mark's clothes, his walkie, everything laying at the bottom. I freaked out because it was in broad daylight, and I was just talking to Mark a few minutes earlier. Now, a few minutes later, he simply vanished. It was one thing to hear the stories and search for the missing, but it's another entirely different thing to witness it firsthand on a search. What the hell could have taken him? There wasn't anything strange in the sky. It was clear as could be and the sun was shining bright. I eventually retired from the park ranger business. I'm grateful for the time I spent there and I truly loved it. I wish I had answers as to what happened to Mark and the other what went missing. That is a tale that defies explanation in my opinion, viewers. What do you think though? Is it aliens? Are they being spirited away? Is there some other explanation? Let us know what you believe happened to Mark and the other missing persons in and around Lost Dutchman State Park. I believe it would be one thing to search for the missing, but another entirely to experience someone you work with disappearing firsthand. On a different subject though, I want to take a moment to give an update on the ongoings at Bienville. There has been reported a 50% regrowth rate for the woods over there. Locals are reporting strange happenings such as raining rose petals in the town itself 
and weird nightmares along with something believed to be lurking in the mirrors of certain citizens' homes. I am working my way there and hopefully will be able to give you a live update sometime by the next episode or two. Moving on now, we have the story of a park ranger in Oregon who swears he encountered Bigfoot. His name is Blake Johnson, and we are lucky enough to meet him in person for the following interview. Case 7, Oregon. Hello, my name is Blake Johnson, and I've been working with the park ranger since 2012. In July of 2017, I had a close encounter with what I believed to be Bigfoot. My story goes like this. I work at Bates State Park here in Oregon. Most of my shifts are the run-of-the-mill repair work and keeping the park well maintained, orderly, that sort of thing. On the 11th of July, however, I was called up by Mike another ranger I work with, and he starts chuckling and tell me I'll never believe what he found. I tell him to try me, and he goes on to say he found a footprint about 14 inches long by 5 and a half inches wide. He says come and see for yourself if I didn't believe him. I head up there where Mike is half laughing at what he says until I come up to this footprint myself. The size is about right, but I start looking around and chuckling, asking him how he created the footprint. Mike was known to be a prankster, so I thought surely he had gotten with Josh, another ranger, and made the footprints. Looking around, however, jo Josh wasn't there, and Mike had a very serious look on his face now. I told him he had to be kidding me and wasn't going to fall for one of his pranks, but he swore up and down that this was real. I laughed and told him, sure before deciding I was probably going to go back to work. That's when my radio went off and Joss was on the other end telling me and Mike to follow the prince. I didn't believe it for a second. I didn't think that Bigfoot was actually the one who left these but decided to go ahead and follow the prince with Mike. It didn't take very long to reach the end of the trail and when we got to the end, Josh looked on in shock, aiming the antenna of his walkie talkie out towards the distance. He told me he swore he saw something standing about 10 feet tall walking off in the distance. I turned towards Josh and Mike and told them to stop bullshitting me and started to turn when I heard what sounded like a loud groaning or more like a howling in the distance. It was loud and very distinct and I froze in place at the sound of it. It happened two more times before stopping. I looked at Josh and Mike and both of them looked scared shitless. It was becoming apparent that these two were pulling one hell of a prank or something was really out here. I turned around very slowly and began down the path and in the direction of the house when Josh asked me what the hell I was doing. I told him I'd have my walkie on, but turned down and was going to check out the source of the sounds coming from the woods. Mike said I was crazy. But I told them, the only way we were going to know is if someone was going to check it out, obviously. Reluctantly, the two of them agreed to stay put and kept close their walkie-talkies while I went deeper into the woods. As I got further from my co-workers, I began to feel this sense that I was being watched. Every step I took, I heard nothing, but I felt like there were eyes on me the entire time. There was a slight fear running through me as I continued to make my way forward until through the trees I'm pretty sure I saw what Josh had spoken about. It was covered in hair, stood about 10 feet, and seemed almost frozen in place. I began to take steps closer so I could get a better view of the figure I was watching when I heard another loud howling from much closer and behind me. I freaked out and turned around to see a similar looking figure about 9 feet tall and appearing angry, standing before me. I cowered in fear, a hand raised to the creature in a shell of submission when it let out another loud howl, this time towards the other creature, who then returned the same howl. Thinking I was going to die, I closed my eyes and prayed with all my might, and just like that I heard a large footstep behind me that shook the ground followed by another step further away. This lasted only a few seconds before everything fell silent again. I'm not ashamed to say I pissed myself just a bit during this. When I finally felt safe again to move, 
I opened my eyes to find nothing around me. I looked in the direction of the other creature only to realize they were both gone. The footprints, however, were still there, and so I radioed Josh and Mike and had them come down, take pictures of the footprints and soon after got a change of clothes and went out for drinks with both of those guys. To this day I'm at a loss as to where the Bigfoot creatures went, but some part of me feels they just wanted to be left alone. One of them could have easily killed me, but instead they let me out with a warning and kept moving. Needless to say, I never went back to the tracks after that. I've come to accept that these creatures are indeed out there. I've gone from being the greatest Bigfoot cynic and critic to becoming a full believer of their existence. There are a lot of things we don't understand in this world, and a lot of creatures we have yet to truly discover. I know what I saw that day, and I don't care if any other soul believes me. I'm here to tell you, Bigfoot exists. Well, listeners, what do you think? Does Bigfoot exist? If so, do you believe they aim to harm people? Or do you believe, like Blake, they are just want to be left alone? Have any of you experienced Bigfoot sightings? Feel free to let me know, and do be sure to be so kind as to share your experiences with us. We are almost at the end of our broadcast, folks. We have quite possibly the most out there and unexplainable story for last. This final case was sent in by a ranger working in Alabama, and it'll make you question everything you believe and know about the world around you. Case number eight, Alabama. Hi John, I just wanted to send in my story about a particularly strange phenomenon that happened in 2012 at Wind Creek State Park here in Alabama. My name is Dale Simpson and I was with the park rangers for about 20 years during my career with them. My story starts simply enough. It was June, and it was fairly hot out. The forecast called for clear skies and sun all day long. That forecast couldn't have been more wrong. It started out hot and sunny, but by the time noon we noticed quite a few clouds beginning to appear overhead. Thinking nothing of it, we went out about our day, working around the park and also watching as people enjoyed their summer. Then we heard the first rumbles of thunder. This was a bit of a strange rumbling though. It almost sounded like it was vocalizing something. A few concerning vacationers asked if it was supposed to rain today. I told them last I checked no, but I'd go ahead and check again to put their minds at ease. Pulling up the weather on my phone there appeared to be nothing appearing on the radar. Stranger yet, the forecast still said sunny skies and clear skies. I told the locals it was still showing sunny, and we all had a laugh at how wrong the forecast was. We thought that maybe a fast developing storm was getting ready to hit, and they didn't have the chance to update things, so we advised everyone to keep an eye on the skies, and if need be, pack up and go home, or find some form of shelter. We even offered to open up an unused wreck area to some if things got too crazy. It's about 3 p.m. when suddenly a large bolt of lightning strikes a tree, and it catches on fire. This quickly followed by an abnormally loud booming thunder, and I and a few other rangers quickly rush people inside, and even offer to open the ranger station to a few of them for shelter. The sky is getting dark and gray, and parts are starting to look greenish in a hue of black in most other areas. I check the weather again and notice there appears to be nothing appearing on the radar. What the hell? I think to myself. No sooner do I do that, does the rain begin to pour, and the wind begins to pick up. The good news was, the fire on the tree was put out quickly, but the bad news was, off in the distance a funnel cloud was beginning to form. It wasn't forming slowly either, it was dropping towards the ground quickly. We got everyone inside, and at this point, locked down everything we could. I was in the ranger station and a few of my crew were barricading in wrecked buildings, or whatever they could find decent shelter in. It wasn't long before a loud resounding boom rang out. Normally, you'd be hearing a freight train sound at this point as the tornado was clearly on the ground, but God is my witness. That wasn't what we heard. No, 
We heard screams of pain and anguish followed by the sound of loud guttural growling likes you've never heard. I just pray I never hear it again. The sky was no longer black, but completely red and peering into the monitor. I watched as a building next to us hit. There were screams of terror, and looking at the storm from the window, I swear I saw a face in this tornado. The tornado was blood red, and the screams continued on for what seemed like a lifetime, when suddenly it faded. Just as quickly as it came, the red vortex shot to the sky above and a bolt of lightning struck the earth before another boom rang out. The skies returned to normal, the clouds parted in the building. All along, everyone who had been inside simply wasn't there anymore. The sun had come out, you'd never know the horror we witnessed had ever happened, and that was that. In a tornado, there should be debris left behind, but in this, there was nothing, nor anyone consumed. Come back again and there were no bodies, and it was as though the building had just vanished. Nothing ever appeared on radar, and further investigation into the matter left it unexplained. I saw a face, and I saw arms reaching in the vortex. Instead of thunder, I heard human screams. I swear to you I'm not crazy. Go ahead and check with some of the other locals and ask them what happened that day, assuming they'll talk about it at all. As a follow-up to this case, it should be noted I did contact residents who were there that day, and the ones willing to speak with me on that matter did indeed claim to have witnessed similar events. A sudden tornado that seemed to scream in rage, it was blood red, had a face and there were many other arms reaching from it, and faces seemingly screaming in pain. Strangely though. Anyone who tried to record what was happening turned up nothing on the recordings. It looked like a sunny day in the footage. So what happened? I'm inclined to believe that this strange phenomenon has something to it, as there have since been ice storms where there has no recorded activity, and rain on sunny days, sun on rainy days, and odd disappearances after these events. Others have come out claiming to hear voices in the wind and all those who have experienced any of the strange phenomena that come with these odd storms swear the weather itself is sentient. There was another case that same summer where a weather forecast showed a tornado warning for specific areas to be safe and the tornado itself seemed to defy all logic by constantly moving outside of the predicted path as the forecast was happening. Focusing. However, on the events Ranger Dale and company, which seemed to be the strangest and most terrifying of them all thus far, lived through, you have to wonder, where were the debris? Where were the bodies sucked up into that storm? Why isn't anything appearing on the footage? I can't begin to know what happened myself, but I'd imagine if I'd experienced something like that. I'd probably be afraid to go outside again. My final thoughts. So, to wrap things up here, we've covered some very out there and some downright disturbing cases tonight. The first case of the night saw a ranger lose her mother to a mysterious entity that appeared to follow her home. Why kill her mother and not the ranger herself? Is the entity still with her now? What is up with the eye? Is it linked to last episode's final case? Or am I speculating too much? What do you think of it all? Tonight's second case followed a former ranger named Jared Mills, and his complete loss as he watched many around his park and his own workers simply disappear over time. Were they raptured? Was it some sort of alien life form or UFO? Did something else happen? The third case tonight followed a Bigfoot skeptic turned true believer as he followed the trail of a Bigfoot only to come face to face with another one. What are your beliefs about Bigfoot? Are they good, evil, indifferent? Do you think we'll ever have solid proof of them? Have you ever seen one yourself? In the most perplexing and possibly scariest story of the night, we were told about sentient weather. 
that seemed to spawn a blood-red tornado with a face. Consuming a large group of people, it simply vanished, leaving no trace behind. Those consumed have never been found, nor has anyone found any wreckage from the building or anything. What do you think happened to the lost in the storm? What caused the storm? Is it even actually the weather or some kind of unknown monstrosity that can somehow control the weather? There are so many questions we could ask ourselves, but sadly, we are out of time tonight. I'd just like to take a moment to say thank you to all our listeners and viewers for your support, and for the warm reception I've received from many of you, as I continue to work on this podcast. Next week, we have a longer show and it will revolve around a single case. Case 9 will definitely leave you disturbed. My name is John Billigan, and I'm signing off for the Creep Factor Podcast. I hope to see you next episode. You have a safe night, everyone. And remember, you are never truly alone. Hello again folks, John Billigan here once again to bring you one of the most disturbing cases on this podcast yet. I will warn listeners in advance that this one is not for the faint of heart. Tonight's cases take place in Devil's Lake State Park, out in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Normally, I'd give updates on previous cases, but in the interest of getting into things, I'll just go ahead and begin tonight's case and save the updates for after. So, without further ado, we present Case 9, It Bleeds Their Sorrows. Hello there, James. Feel free to begin when you're ready. (sighs) Okay, okay. Forgive me. I'm a tad shaken. I'm not sure how long this is going to be, but here we go. Honestly, I'm not sure how long this has been going on, but the first time I bore witness to these events was in the fall of 2000. I was driving to work that morning like any other. I believe it was October 1st, and after reporting in, I made my rounds around the park. I was supposed to do a morning cleanup, check for trash, make sure things are working, that sort of thing. That's all well, good, but... At around 9 of this morning, I began to hear the cries of a baby. Confused and obviously concerned, I walked towards the sound of the crying. The closer I got, the louder the sounds got until I finally stood a few feet from the edge of the lake. At the lake's edge was someone in a black dress, back to me. I stepped closer and remember feeling a bit sick. Something wasn't right. And so, I did the only thing I knew to do. I asked if everything was alright. There was no response. Only louder cries of a baby. I asked once again if things were okay. Still no response, and so I approached the figure. The closer I got to her, the more nauseous I became. I was hearing that baby cry louder, but now, it sounded as though it was in my own head. This, in turn, changed. It became the cries of more children. I was just about to reach the woman in the black dress, when I grew dizzy, and suddenly, she vanished and it was daylight. I was wandering out on the lake at around 9 in the morning, when I heard this baby's crying. Now, it was suddenly 11 a.m., and another ranger, Jack, was tapping me on the shoulder, asking me if I'm alright. I told him I'm fine, but in truth, I wasn't sure what to think. Jack asked me why I was staring at the lake. He claimed I'd been doing so since he showed up at around 10.30. I told him I was lost in the beauty of the lake. I made up some mumbo jumbo about appreciating the view and enjoying these sorts of sights in life, as life can be short. He laughed and said he was glad I was okay as he was worried. 
I didn't speak to him about what was really going on as I didn't understand it myself. The rest of the day was normal though. I clocked out and headed home at around noon. Fast forward to that night. I'm laying there sleeping. While sleeping, I'm taken back to the lake in my dreams. The, the woman in the black dress is standing, her back to me once again, while a baby cries somewhere near the lake. I assume she was... She must be holding a child, maybe? But I never saw for sure. Just as in the situation itself, I will get close, become nauseous, grow dizzy, hear the cries of an innumerable amount of children, and then I was awake in a sweat. I looked at my watch and it was 11pm. I took a moment to breathe and pondered what the hell was going on. I looked up for a moment, and in the mirror on my wall, I swear I saw the woman in the black dress, back turned towards me, and the lake, but then I rubbed my eyes and saw nothing but my own reflection again. I didn't sleep the remainder of the night, and left for work again at about 3am. Mind you, the park doesn't officially open until around 8.30 during the fall, but I wanted to check out the lake. I arrived at work at around 3.30 in the morning, and began looking around the grounds. It was when I neared the same spot on the lake I saw the woman in black once again. Her back turned toward me, the crying of a child. I tried to move closer, but the sound of the child's crying was overbearing. Suddenly, I felt myself crying. I wasn't sure why, but it was sudden and as though the child's sorrow were my own. This was when it got weird. I go to brush the tears from my eyes, and suddenly, I notice my tears are not tears. I'm bleeding from my eyes. Freaked out, I fall back on the ground, and suddenly, it's daylight. Jack is there again, calling my name. He tells me it's 8.30 and I should probably clock in. I turn towards him, shaking a bit when he asks if I'm okay. I recollect myself feeling my face and noticing no tears or blood. I then smile and tell him I'm okay. I just didn't sleep much last night. I head back to the main office and clock in when my radio crackles to life. It's Jack. He tells me I better come over quickly. I rush over and when I get there he's holding on to something in a towel. Suddenly, the police are there and when I see what he's holding, it's a dead baby. The child looks as though they drowned. I see the flash of the woman, and then I'm back to present day. The next while is a bit of a blur. The police question me, and I wasn't sure what to say. I wound up telling them I hadn't seen anything. I mean, I hadn't in a way. I certainly didn't see a dead child washing up from the lake. Shaken, I return home. We closed the next few days while the police ran their investigation. The child was a woman named Tamara Harper. She was found later on, drowned in the lake as well. The police ruled it a suicide and Tamara had postpartum depression which drove her to murder suicide. That seemed like that. I couldn't make sense of it though. Why would I have been seeing that? Was it a sort of premonition? Is that even a real thing? I was off a bit the next few days of work but I recollected myself and things seemed fine till the 15th. The night of the 14th I had horrid dreams. I saw the woman in the black dress, I heard children crying, and I woke up in a sweat at around 2 in the morning. All that entered my mind is that another mother may be drowning her child. I drove to work and cased the ground until it was time to clock in at 8.30. I saw nothing. No one was around. Nothing was out of the ordinary at all. The lake had been silent and things seemed to be okay. The rest of the day was completely uneventful. It was the morning of the 18th when I awoke to a call on my day off to come down to the lake. There was another mother and child drowned. The news was shocking and we closed the park again. The investigation was quick and we reopened the park by Monday the 21st. The park asked for volunteers to walk the grounds at night. I volunteered to take the first night. I spent the night on the 21st walking the grounds and searching. 
nothing happened. In the morning, I head to my truck and go to get some shut-eye. I have another dream. I'm at the lake. Much of the events occur as they typically do in these dreams. There's the woman in black, back to me. The baby crying. There's the sound of thunder this time. The rushing of the wind and the rain begins. The rain isn't normal. I can hear the baby's cries. I see lightning up in the night sky. As I look above, I notice how the rain is blood. The lake is now red, and the sky is red as well. I'm overcome with the crying of children, and just as it's about to overwhelm me completely, I see the woman in the black dress turn my way. Her tears are black. Her face is shockingly familiar. One of our rangers, Annalise Sanders, was recently a mom. She'd been off work while she raised her three-month-old. I freaked out as the woman's face began distorting and she turned away. I hear a burst of dark laughter. It is female, but I've never heard it in the past. I shoot awake and rush towards the park. I notice about two in the morning and I'm trying to call Anna over and over again, with no response. I just keep getting her voicemail. I'm panicking by the time I get to the park. I quickly head toward the spot on the lake that we always find the bodies at. That's when I see Jack, passed out on the ground. I wake up and he explains he isn't sure what happened. He was just suddenly tired, then all of a sudden... He just... fell, I guess. I then rush towards the waters of the lake and reel back in horror as Anna Lee is floating, face towards the sky, wrist slit in the waters. Then, well, her child Leanne was... <laughs> It's okay. Take your time. I'm not even sure how to say it or if I should. The child, the innocent baby girl, wasn't whole. She was in the water in pieces. It, it made no sense. It, it makes no sense. Anna Lee was a happy woman. She was no murderer. She certainly wouldn't do such an evil act to herself or her child, but damn well not to her child. If that wasn't bad enough, things got worse. The park was closed indefinitely for a time. Signs were put up warning visitors not to commit suicide there. The lake itself was beginning to draw murder suicides. The news and the police investigation confirmed that Anna Lee chopped up her baby with an axe before laying in the lake and slitting her wrists. Do you know... Do you even want to know what's even more messed up about it all? She was smiling while she was floating in the water. Smiling? It, it didn't make sense and it didn't add up. On October 30th, I was sorting through my mail when I found an unaddressed handwritten letter and it said, The sky bleeds their sorrow. The sky sees their pain. It understands the suffering of innocence. The lake bleeds away, a sign of their end. The red a sign of future's trend. The blood of the innocents won't soon end. It bleeds their sorrows. I immediately called up the police and they came down and checked it out. But they, they couldn't tell me where it came from or who sent it. I slept that night uncomfortably, to say the least. I was at that godforsaken lake again. The woman in black had her head turned back to me once more. Babies cried, but no nausea overcame me as I got close. I soon arrived next to see the woman to see a child in hand. I couldn't see her face this time. I did, however, hear her laughter. A peal of laughter that soon resonated from all around the lake. I saw many women. Some I recognized. Some I did not. All standing in black dresses smiles on their faces. I heard the sound of gunfire, one by one as they blew out their brains. I heard the bodies fall and one after the next. I woke screaming. I called the police in the park and I floored it to the lake. By the time I arrived it was too late. It was about 2 a.m. Halloween morning and I arrived to find hundreds of bodies floating in the blood-colored lake. Babies and mothers all dead. 
I was in tears, at a loss and in a daze. The police questioned me. I tried to explain the dreams I had and everything leading up to that point. They wound up drug testing me. I was obviously clean. They weren't sure what to think of my story after that, but I was ruled out as a suspect. They closed the park for a remainder of the year. Nothing else happened that year. There were no more murder-suicides, no more deaths at the park in any way. January rolled up and around and the lake was frozen. I went back to work. No one discussed with me my story to the police or even brought the subject up. You could tell they wanted just to continue on as though nothing had changed. In some ways, I was grateful no one brought up the subject of the deaths or my story to the police. In other ways, I was sick at the thought of trying to pretend everything was normal. We'd put up signs and hired a regular security detail around the lake at nights. Everything was normal except for when I'd go by the lake. I'd see the innocent and senseless deaths, and I could hear the baby's cries of sadness. I was sure this wasn't actually happening. The memories of the events were still very much there in my mind and fresh. The sounds and emotions from it all echoed like a ghost in its own right. Fast forward to the 3 a.m. October 1st, 2001, I slept that night like any other, but was awoken to a phone call. The night security officer was found dead. She hung herself from a tree, just outside the lake, and there was no baby involved in this death, or so he thought, but someone camping said they called the police as they heard someone screaming and crying. Cards beneath the body, at the same tree that the security guard hung herself from was a poem. I saw their pain, I heard their cries, I felt their deaths. She slowly took their lives, she is a devil, she lives upon the lake, the woman in black, a devil in waiting. It would later come out that the carving was done by the security officer just before she hung herself. A fingernail was missing from her finger and had chipped off while she clawed the message into the wood. It was later found that the security guard was two months pregnant. They don't believe she was aware she was pregnant at the time. After these events, I asked my superiors if we could close the park again. They disagreed. At least, they did until the 4th of October rolled around. The night of October 4th would be the site of the largest mass suicide at the lake. I tried to sleep that night, but I slept poorly. I had a nightmare about the woman in black. The nightmare went as follows. I was at the lake and it was red. The woman in black stood at the lake's edge. She seemed to smile. Her eyes were black. Rain began, but it, was, it wasn't what you would expect. Instead of rain, I saw bodies falling from the sky. The bodies of babies, their moms smiling as they dropped in as well. The lake shook and the woman in black stepped forward. Soon after she turned, she hovered above the center of the lake. A devilish smile crossed her lips. The woman held something wrapped in her arms. I assumed it was a baby as she sank under the red stained lake. There was a laughter, so sinister as shook me awake. I awoke to a message on my phone. The park was closed through October and would be closed every October on account of the most recent deaths. The news final number said there were 24 deaths that night. Mothers with children and future mothers carrying children inside. They came from all over the states. They were all murder suicides. I felt sick to my stomach and wondered why. During my time off, I looked into ways that this could possibly have happened. I was convinced that whatever we were dealing with, it wasn't human. I contacted a priest and I had a long discussion with him. Eventually, I convinced him to come to the lake. I asked him to bless it, cleanse it, and do anything he could. And so he did. The remainder of the month, nothing happened. We reopened in November and things seemed fine. I remember feeling elation as another year went by and into November of 2002, we had no deaths. No murder-suicides of any kind happened at the lake in that time span. My dreams were no longer torturing me, and I slept peacefully. Fast forward to October of 2003, we decided it was okay to reopen the park during October. We split shifts with ourselves and local law enforcement to be sure things were fine. 
It was a beautiful October. I was so happy as it went off without a hitch. Baraboo soon forgot the tragedies of the past. I was quite thankful for that. Things were normal and I even met someone. Her name was Evelyn, and I was smitten with her. We hit it off almost immediately. I'd begun to go to church more frequently since the blessing and that's where I met her. It was October of 2004 when we got married. I felt like the luckiest guy alive. My job was great, the deaths had stopped, and I'd fallen in love, and now I was married to the woman of my dreams. Life couldn't have been more perfect, or so I thought. I wish this is where the story ended, but sadly, it isn't. It was March of 2005, and my woman and I had just gotten to the most amazing news. She was pregnant. I spoke with my bosses and was able to pick up some extra shifts. I wanted to be ready for our child's arrival. May of 2005, I got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. Evelyn was sleeping and I went into the bathroom. I thought I heard laughter. It was only a split second's worth, so I shook it off. I soon washed my hands and when I looked up to grab a towel, I saw the smiling face of the black woman. I jumped back for a second before rubbing my eyes and looking again. I studied the mirror for quite some time. I was terrified for a second, but eventually I laughed to myself assuming I was just seeing things, as I was still half asleep. I went back to sleep and woke up later that morning to head to work. I had arrived at work and was heading toward my desk when I saw a red eye on it. It looked as though it was written in blood. I was the second person in that day and I asked Jack if he had noticed my desk. He said no as he'd pretty much clocked in and headed out and was only just now getting back to the office. I showed him the eye and underneath was also a message. The message was two words. Always watching. This unnerved me. And when we had the police come down, they discovered it was written in deer's blood. We had the police take the desk and soon moved and order one from the storage into my office. I tried not to think about what had happened or jump to conclusions as I filled out my paperwork and then went out to check around the park. Stepping inside, I found myself with this odd need to go to the lake. I walked that way and back to the spot where the security officer had hung herself years ago. I'm staring out at the lake when I suddenly see her hanging from the tree. It happens quickly. I'd say as quickly as one might blink. Because of the nature of what happened, I thought maybe the death thing and being around the area was making my PTSD act up from years of events. I had been doing great. I had been seeing a therapist, I would quit drinking, and as time had gone on, I would occasionally have an episode. I was mostly at peace with the situations of the past though. They would happened and I knew I needed to move forward. Going to church more and more often and meeting Evelyn really helped me get past the weird stuff that happened a few years prior. So again, I just thought this was a minor episode and decided I'd head back to the office. The moment I turned around I hear a baby crying and I'm taken aback by it. I spin around and see nothing. The trees blew in a light breeze and the lake seemed mostly unsettled. I headed back to the office and spent the rest of the day doing paperwork and that was that. The early morning hours of August 1st, I was sleeping for work when I had a dream. In it, Evelyn was crying. There was so much blood. I saw that the devil in black was there too. That horrid witch. She stood there laughing. She walked into the mirror's reflection before fading entirely. I woke up to the sound of baby crying. I was sweating and screaming. Evelyn woke up and we spent from about 2 to 4 in the morning talking about my dream. She assured me everything was fine. I felt her belly and that day we scheduled a checkup for my wife just to be sure. The doctor's visit was reassuring. They said that she was perfectly fine and our soon to be baby boy was healthy. My mind at ease, I volunteered to look over the park overnight. My wife called me at about 4 in the morning to check up on me, claiming she couldn't get back to sleep and she just wanted to talk. As I'm walking the grounds, we talk some more. She eventually tells me she had a dream about an angel in black. She said she couldn't see his face, but she felt comfort while around her. I asked her what the angel wore, and she told me she had a long black dress. I grew cold with terror and asked her if everything seemed okay. 
She said yes, everything was fine. Shortly after, she told me she loved me and then that she was going to try to get some sleep. After she hung up, I felt a cold sweat over my brow. It couldn't be, right? I shook my head and tried to brush this off. My wife didn't seem concerned, so why should I, right? I went back to my office and clocked out. I was walking out of the office when Jack showed up. He greeted me and asked if I noticed anything strange going on while watching over the park. I told him no and asked why he asked. He shook his head and explained on his way he noticed a sign that had another red eye painted over it. It was dry and he would take care of it and didn't want to bother me too much. I told him to call the police and he did and on my way out I noticed the eye. Under it were the words, always watching. This made me feel unnerved and upon driving home I talked to my wife. This was where I began to think something was really off. My wife greeted me happily. She seemed well rested and offered to make us some breakfast. I accepted, and when I spoke to her about what happened, she smiled and said, sure, everything is fine. Evelyn then went on to say it was probably just kids trying to be creepy. I explained the first time it was in deer's blood and it was likely the eye was painted in something similar. What kid do you know that is normal is going to kill a deer just to use its blood to spook people? Evelyn looked me in the eyes and smiled. It's fine. I'm sure of it. There was a moment during that conversation, just after she reassured me it's fine, that I thought of her laughter. Again, I brushed it off and said, you're probably right. I thought maybe I was just spooked. I mean, I definitely was unnerved at the thought of everything happening. It gets worse when I'm at work the next morning though. I was working on installing a new sign when it hit me. I had gone over my dreams previously with Evelyn. She knew this woman in black looked like, so if the woman in her dream was the same that I had seen before, the deaf sand in my dreams, why wasn't she worried? It, I took a quick break. I, I, I had to call my wife. I confronted her about the dreams, but she claimed it wasn't the same woman. She claimed this woman had a warm air about her, and she was always comforting. I nodded and took a breath. I apologized for my worry, but Evelyn laughed and said it was okay. She was happy to have a husband who was concerned for her and also our future child. Hanging up, I went about the day normal. Everything was fine. I had heard some of some things around the lake that were a bit off, but I figured I was just stressed from my previous worry over my wife and child. The rest of August went fine. September came and went, and by October, I was keeping a close eye on my now 7th month pregnant wife. Halloween was tomorrow and I wanted to be sure she was well rested before I headed off to work. I was going to watch over the park again. Though no real deaths had occurred for quite some time, we still wanted to take every precaution. Besides, if we could, we wanted to also catch the vandal who kept leaving the eyes on trees and around the park. That night was the night things began to change for me. It was the saddest night of my life. It was 12.04 a.m. Halloween morning when my radio came to life. On the other end was my wife's voice, and she was crying. I asked her why she was out here and if everything was okay. She said she wanted to check on me, but she didn't see me around the office. She decided to head to the lake. This was the point where her entire demeanor changed. The pain in her voice was no longer there, and she sounded at peace. Evelyn said it'll be alright, James. He'll be at peace, in, in heaven. The radio went dead and I immediately bolted to the lake. I'd never run so fast, but upon my arrival, I felt sick. My wife was standing at the edge of the lake and my vision was blurring in and out. I heard cries of children. I, I ran forward and I, w I was quickly overcome with a searing pain in my gut. I looked up and saw my wife smiling as she pointed towards the lake and I heard her asking me if I could see the angel. I looked ahead and there she stood in the center of the lake, the woman in black. I cried out to Evelyn, telling her to stay with me. She smiled and said it would be okay, we'd meet again in heaven someday. I screamed in horror and tried to call the police. I couldn't stand from the pain and I was into the... the oh my god. I was in so much pain I could not stand and it was just, it was so hard to even try to get my phone to work and this battery was being drained by whatever force was around me. The most horrific sound of babies crying continued rattling within my mind. Slowly, 
<sighs> Slowly, my wife began to walk towards the lake. I tried to stand, but every time the thought crossed my mind, I felt a clawing from inside my gut. I was horrified at what I was witnessing and how hopeless I was. I screamed for help, but no one seemed to come. I was desperate and alone. All, all I could do was watch as my wife's feet touched the water. I watched as she waded through the water. I saw her turn her head around when she was chest high. I, I watched her pull out a knife, smiling one final time before the gutting began. I, I was overcome with sounds of a single child's cry. I'm quite sure it was the sound of my would-be son, as his mother stabbed him. My wife continued stabbing, and she smiled as she died. Eventually, she plunged a knife and pulled up this time, cutting her belly completely open. I felt myself unable to stand, and I ran toward the waters of the lake. The cries of my child that previously resonated within my mind fell silent as I watched my wife slit her throat, then fall over dead. I remember holding her lifeless body in the lake. Most of the rest of everything was a blur that day. Please question me. I took a ton of time off work. I tried to continue, to, I tried to continue months later, but I just couldn't. I quit in the end. I, could, I couldn't handle the grief, and I just found other work. I became a facilities guide at a local school a few towns away. I enjoyed the peace, and I enjoyed being nowhere near a lake. The people in the area didn't bother me about the lake, and I'm still sad to this day. I know internally I'll always be alone. I'll never forget about the devil on the lake it roamed. Sometimes I still have nightmares of her and my wife. I wake up crying, but I've never seen her in waking life since. I had a dream once where my wife and child reassured me it'd be okay. They looked so at peace. I couldn't help but feel comfort by this. That was until my wife said, Don't worry, my love. We'll meet in heaven. Someday. I followed up on this story in the police of Baraboo and are still at a loss. They inform me that the park remains open to this day and while at times there are odd deaths, the activity is greatly lessened. They have the waters blessed once again and it's his custom now for them to do so at least once a year. James still works at a local school in another town, but for his privacy, we won't divulge where. Our hearts go out to him and his family. If you're listening to this, James, we're very sorry for your loss. I do not wish to be so insensitive, so that's why I took a pause. But moving forward, we have some updates and news. Most notably, the updates come from our next stop, Bienville. Anyone who's been listening to this podcast or following happenings around there is quite familiar with this place. The update is simply to report that the forest seems to have fully regrown. This makes little to no sense and is one of the many things that we plan to investigate the next episode. That's right friends, we are finally making it to Bienville ourselves for the next episode of this podcast. We plan to do some interviews of the latest goings around this strange town as well as do our own investigating into what is going on within the forest itself. How has it grown so quickly? Does a certain devil still lurk within it? What is up with the mirrors as of late within the town? For those new to the podcast or simply need a refresher, people have been reporting a woman in a mirror as of late. I've got more info that suggests this leading to strange death and mysterious disappearances. What could possibly be going on out there? Here are my final thoughts tonight. Tonight we listen to the case of a ranger named James. Because of the dark nature of the case and length, I decided to make it the only case for this episode. Why did so many mothers commit murder-suicide with their children? Was the land cursed? Is there really some sort of devil or witch out there influencing these women to commit these acts? If that's the case, how do you explain the mass murder-suicide event that led to people coming from out of state? coming into town to commit such tragedies. Yes, some out-of-towners were simply visiting, but 
there were a few that actually just came to the lake minutes before they committed their horrific act. This, in my opinion, suggests that whoever or whatever is causing these things clearly has reached beyond the town itself. Then again, perhaps the case of news spreading and everyone seeing this as a suicide lake. I believe the former seems more likely, however, as the further I dig into these things around this case, the more it seems something is truly reaching these people and causing them to commit horrible crimes. Too many of these women were just perfectly happy prior to their murder suicides. Add to that that Evelyn, who clearly was a happy, expected mother. She and James had a perfectly happy life. Until the tragic end, James was more excited than ever about becoming a father and finally somewhat moved on from his past experiences. Then, there is the final part of this case I'd like to note. The eye has made another return. I don't take this lightly and refuse to brush this off at this point. This eye has appeared in three cases that we've spoken on up to this point. I've looked into other sightings and it has appeared in a quite a few others which we will be hopefully addressing in future podcasts. What is up with the eye? What is its connection to the case it sits in? Is this some kind of a cult symbol? Is there something more to it? I get chills just thinking about the eerie nature of its continued appearance. What is with the eye? Anyway, I'm John Billigan, and I'd like to say thank you to all our listeners for your continued viewership, support, and your patience. I know there are reports where we have gone a while between episodes, but the truth is it takes some time to put everything together, and in some cases, travel affects these things as well. Thank you so much, and we look forward to reaching you from Bienville, next episode of the Creep Factor Podcast. I'm John Billigan, and I'm signing off. Till next time. Hello folks, this is John Billigan of the Creep Factor Podcast. Tonight I have a special many of you have long been waiting for. We are interviewing residents about the goings-ons of the area around Bienville, where some of you may remember almost a year ago, several strange murders and missing persons cases took place. These cases were followed up on by the state park services and law enforcement officials. To keep a very long story I'm sure many of you are familiar with short, it ended in the entire forest being burned to the ground by a now deceased park ranger by the name of Tim Evans. Tim was convinced there was something demonic in the forest, and that it led to the death of his daughter, as well as the death of his partner, Wayne. Some believe he died saving the town, but many others believe every bit as much that he lost it after losing so much, and snapped, killing himself and potentially trying to take down the entire town with him. Theories aside, what has been going around the area almost a year later? Well, folks, that's what I'm here to find out. Now, tonight we are going to be doing things a bit differently. Normally, we interview folks with park services about strange happenings on the job. While we will be doing that tonight, we are also going to interview some townsfolk, not with the park rangers who have compelling and strange stories about the things going on since the Great Fire. Our first interview will be with the current head of the park rangers here, Thomas Winchuk. So without further delay, how are you tonight, Thomas? I'm doing quite well, John. Thank you. Alright, Thomas. Walk us through some of the odd things going on currently in the town. Feel free to start anywhere you'd like. Well, to start, I want to mention the strangest thing going on out here. The forest. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's fully grown back and, stranger still, it appears to be bigger than before. It's been roughly six months since the fire itself, and I don't think I need to say it's strange for something that burnt down completely and even took some of the town and the fire to grow back completely in such a short time frame, and even overtake the areas burned to the ground within the town. So, to start, I'll say that's beyond the natural, not only in my opinion, but in fact. There are other things though, John. Please, feel free to share at your own pace. I believe you mentioned you had some things you wanted to let us in on within your job when I talked to you a few weeks back. Yes, that'd be a great place to start. So, since Tim's death, 
there have been more missing persons popping up. Initially, this wasn't the case, but as the forest has regrown, so have the oddities around the town and the missing. When I first took over, I looked into the case files linked to the strange goings on around the area. It was while sorting through some of the notes Tim left behind, Wayne and Agent Sawyer, that I found a file marked 1-1-2019. The file was shoved within the notes. Hesitantly, I opened the file to find a message. It read, Blessed be they who see. This message was at the bottom of the paper, but after reading it, the paper itself began to, well, bleed. Once the blood stopped pouring, there sat an eye. I felt drawn into it as I stared at it and I simultaneously had the sensation that it read every thought and even my life. My fears and worries, the lies I had told, I felt I knew everything about me. This was unnerving, to say the least, but it had nothing on what happened next. The day grew dark and the windows bled in a red hue. I stood from my desk and looked outside. The sky around me was red. I didn't understand it and I was afraid. Looking into the distance, I saw something I can't even put into words. It cannot be described, but the emotions I felt during this time can be. Fear, dread, hopelessness. I felt myself wanting to rip the flesh from my body and run. My mind began to make less and less sense, and just as I thought I was going to lose my mind completely, I felt something touch my shoulder. It was at that point I jumped out of my chair and fell onto the floor in pain. I could still hear a language I didn't understand whispering inside my mind as I looked up to see Dale, my new hire looking at me perplexed. He informed me that he'd been trying to contact me since yesterday to let me know he had some business to discuss. Dale wasn't in town till Wednesday. The thing is, I opened that file on Tuesday afternoon. I was missing a decent period of time between the time I opened the file and the time Dale came into my office. I didn't feel as though I'd slept at all. The transition from what I was seeing in this, I, I guess dream? From when I opened the file was seamless. It was as if it was happening in real time. I'm not sure what I was seeing, but I took the file, shoved it back in the folder and locked it away. As time went on, I could hear the voices whispering something incoherently. When I'd sleep, I'd have nothing but nightmares. I'd see images I often didn't understand and I'd wake up in a sweat. I brought a copy of the message. I think it's safe to look at it as it seems to have no effect in comparison to the original. I've tested it on myself and that's all I can say about that. Keep it for your own records, anyway, to get on point again, I got a call about the woods on Friday, sometime in mid-January if I remember it right. Now supposedly, a local named Marnie had gone into the woods and her family hadn't seen or heard from her in a few days since. We scanned the woods and found nothing. No trace of her or anything of the sort. Having nothing to go on, we checked out her home. It was there things got much stranger. Stepping in, you could feel the difference in the air. The closer you got to the house, the more off things felt. Once inside, however, it felt downright suffocating and honestly oppressive. I walked in and found all sorts of symbols I didn't understand. There was a painting in the dining room of a rose. The painting appeared to be done in black paint. A few weeks later after testing the material, it turned out to be Marnie's blood. I'm aware of how little sense that this makes, since people don't bleed black, right? As we continued to look deeper within the home, we found more disturbing evidence that Marnie had potentially lost her mental faculties. Marnie was a single, 32-year-old woman who was very religious and very close to her family. She seemed perfectly fine mentally and was at church every Sunday according to many of her family, friends, and even the other locals. Stepping into her bedroom, though, told a much different story. Written on the walls in what was clearly blood were the words, Always watching. Once would have been strange enough, twice stranger still. This was written hundreds of times and in some cases written again at different angles over previously written messages of the same thing. 
Stranger still was her bed which sat in the corner of the room. After moving the bed, there was a secret hatch. Painted on it was the same red eye. I felt the whispering grow inside my head the moment I saw it. I felt sick and keeled over. The world had changed around me and the red hue had filled the room once again. Looking up, I could see bodies intertwined. Some had no eyes, others no tongues. Some sat with mouths sewn shut, but I could hear all their voices within my head. The bodies were contorted and seemingly melted together. They all formed that damned eye, and for a moment, I believed I saw the eye blink. There was a shrill screaming, and about the time I felt my head was going to explode, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I jumped back, but came back too. Dale was there once again. I told him he scared me, and not to do that again, to be louder next time when he wanted to approach me. Dale chuckled, and then with a concern, he asked if I was okay, as he mentioned he thought the floorboards creaked plenty, and he was sure I'd heard him. Shortly after that, we went back to the station. It should be mentioned we did contact the police, and from that point forward, they worked in conjunction with us for Marnie. I attended to do the less pressing matters for the remainder of the day, and headed home that night to relax and get my mind off of anything related to the case. I was watching television that night when the lights went out. The television then turned on and went to static. I searched through my house and tried the lights, but nothing. I then went back to the television which sat at static. C confused, I, I unplugged my TV, but the static didn't stop, it just kept going. It was audible at first, but it was soon drowned out by the sound of dripping. It felt as though I'd lost my hearing, but I could hear the dripping. There was a flash of an image, and then another. They flashed so quickly I couldn't quite make out what they were. The power suddenly came on, and then I came to. The lights were working fine, but it was midnight. I'd lost two and a half hours. I didn't sleep well the remainder of the night. The next morning I loaded up on coffee and headed to work. The following workday things got stranger yet. Every time I blinked I'd see the flashes of some things. None of them made any sense. There was no pattern to it. The only recognizable thing was there was an eye in some of the images, and someone in one of the images. That image that stuck with me deeply was a woman hanging. This one stuck with me because while I saw it while blinking, it wasn't like the others. Instead of happening once and a new image might happen another time, it was like I blinked into the image itself. I know how that sounds. I know how crazy it seems, but that's the best way and the only way I know how to describe it. Imagine staring at a picture enough, and then suddenly, you're in it, seeing it play out like a movie. That's basically how it was, but I blinked into it. I recognized the woman in the image. It was, it was Marnie. I, I watched her in this memory or image or whatever the hell you wish to call it. I watched her hang herself. I saw her breathe her last breath, and soon after that she held her palms open. Marnie's palms were bleeding. The drops of blood made the same dripping sound from my experience the night before. I was snapped to once again by a call from the sheriff. She told me they'd found Marnie, hanging from a tree, her arms open, bleeding, and two crosses seemingly cut into her hands. I went down to check out the site, and I was at a loss. It appeared to be a suicide, but evidence said so something different. I just felt something was wrong. No, something wasn't right here. I, I don't know what it was. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out exactly what happened to Marnie. I wish I had, but I still hear the incoherent whispers even as we speak now. The nightmares have gotten much worse, and I'm presently on leave from my job with Dale taking my place. I'm lucky to get an hour of sleep at night. It doesn't feel right. I'm terrified if I sleep whatever the hell that this thing is, that I, or whatever it represents. Well, I'm terrified I'll end up like Marnie. There's something strange still going on in this town, and I'm of the belief that Marnie didn't commit suicide. I'm of the belief that she was murdered. Thank you for your time, Thomas, and we ask that you stay safe. Anything else you'd like to add before we end this interview? 
Nothing other than to say thank you, sir, for hearing me out and covering this seriously. A lot of people think I'm crazy now, but uh, I know what I see at night, and I know what I've seen since I initially took over. Have a good night, and if you are wise, you'll leave this town as quickly as you came. Of course, Thomas. Have a safe night. Well, listeners, thankfully we won't be staying here too long. However, we do have some more interviews to conduct tonight, and while our next guests get ready, we'd like to deliver some updates on strange happenings elsewhere. The main one being that we'd like to give our sincerest condolences to the family and friends of Dana Hanley. She went missing shortly after her interview with us, and was recently found, sadly, deceased. We are not allowed to go into any more details, but rest assured, we will keep you updated as we learn more. In more unfortunate news, Darren J. Wendell, who you may remember as the man in case 4 of our first Strange Things I've Seen as a Park Ranger episode, has vanished. The details behind this one are strange. In his home were strange symbols to what you had just heard about from Thomas. There was also an eye painted on his front door in blood. Since his disappearance in February, people have claimed to see a naked man sometimes floating around the lake at the park he used to work at. Those that have reported on this have been dead set on what they saw, and some are even claiming to have nightmares involving the ever-present eye. I'd like listeners to understand that I will be updating you with more information as we get it, and if things aren't solved soon, we will be going back to Montana to check the case out ourselves. In strange but less grim news, residents in California, Alaska, Delaware, New York, and South Dakota thus far have reported running into a man on the roadways at night who has performed strange miracles in return for a ride to a specific destination. One man, Walter Danley of Deadwood, South Dakota, claims he has been given a winning lottery ticket in return for a ride to the next town over and some food. He never got to see the man's face, but he says he was incredibly grateful to the man and is thankful he didn't ignore the man's gift. This may be strange, but possibly explainable. We are going to be heading out to an interview with a woman in New York in the near future who claimed to have had a run-in with this man and says he cured her terminal illness. All right, dear listeners, our next guest is ready to go. Please stay with us as we speak with... Hannah Winston, is it okay to proceed with my story? Yes, ma'am, you may. Real quick, I'd like to add that Hannah doesn't work for any park services. She does, however, have an incredibly strange tale to share with us. Forgive me for the interruption, and please proceed. Alright, so, I live near the forest in question. I'd say it was about the beginning of last month when I awoke to the sight of rose petals raining down upon my house. I'm not sure how to explain it, other than to say that the petals were black and while looking at my window, I noticed a lot of people just standing in the distance. I didn't recognize these people, and they lasted as long as the storm itself. The moment the petals stopped falling, people vanished. I lived near the woods as I stated previously, and all the people I saw were in the woods. These people didn't seem to cross that threshold of the woods. Now this and them vanishing before my eyes once the petals faded was strange enough, but later that night, it got weirder. I began receiving voicemails. These voicemails were from random people I didn't even know. The caller ID was filled with numbers I didn't know. I thought someone might be pulling a prank or some kind of scam on me, so I looked the numbers up. They were numbers of real people. When I attempted to get into contact with these people, they'd never answer. I tried digging deeper as I was fairly freaked out by this, only to find that the people in question leaving the voicemails, were all missing or deceased. About a week later, I'm still getting these odd voicemails. I'm scared and local law enforcement just suggest I change my number, which I did, but I still got the voicemails every time. It'd go like, I'd get a call, it'd go straight to voicemail, even if I picked up, there'd be no one on the other end, but I'd still get a voicemail. Anyway, I'm getting ready to go to work one morning and as I'm heading out to my car, I see someone seemingly in my car. I call the police who come down to find no one. I'm screaming my head off, how can you not see him? He's right there. The officer suggests I take the day off and try to relax. So I call into work and use a sick day. 
I don't work the next two days after that, so I figured it'd be an extended weekend, and hopefully I could relax. It's still eating at me that there was clearly a man in the car. I look outside, and he's not there now, but he was there when the police searched, but for whatever reason, they didn't see him. I couldn't see the man's face, just his clothing. He had pretty standard clothes, and looked like he had to be about six foot at least. All weekend I get calls. They're usually around two in the morning, but at this point, I'm ignoring them and I have my phone on silent. One late Saturday night, I'm relaxing in bed and am woken by a feeling of breath on my neck. I am frozen at first, but I eventually grow brave enough to turn and see who might be there. T -t to my horror, the man is there and trying to say something, but it's coming at all jumbled and I can't understand it. Looking closer, I noticed he has no tongue. I'm just about to call the police when he fades before my eyes. I'll be the first to admit about, and none of this makes any sense. I, I still have no clue how the voicemails are being left or why. I'm not sure what's up with those rose petals or the man. Last week was the first week I stopped receiving strange voicemails. I haven't seen the man either. I have, however, been having nightmares. In them, the woods call out to me. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I hope you find answers, but more importantly, peace in the future. Well, listeners, what do you think of these oddities? Are they attached to the woods themselves? Could there be something else afoot? Let us know your thoughts. Moving along, we've got one more guest tonight. Now this gentleman could not be here tonight, but did send in his recent experiences, so I'll read them for you, and they go as follows. Hello, John. My name is Winrick. I wanted to say I enjoyed the show and also tell you about my own experiences near Bienville. I'll start out by saying I knew Tim outside of his work and he was a good and honest man. As such, if he believed there was some unnatural or unexplainable threat to our town, I believe him and I'm saddened by his and many other deaths around the area. My experiences around the area definitely lend credence to the fact that something odd is still happening and has been happening in the area. The thing I'd like to address most is the lady in the mirror. Shortly after the fire, and when it was safe to return to town again, I began hearing things in the night. I'd be laying there in bed, perfectly relaxed and listening to some of the crickets, and such, when I'd feel like I was being called. At first, it was just that, a feeling. As time went on though, that feeling changed to a soft voice. The voice simply said, I miss you. Unsure of where the voice was coming from, I looked around. This is when I saw her in the mirror. A woman who looked maybe 18 to 20 years old, blue hair, a light complexion, almost like a doll. She wore a black dress and as I gazed upon her, I felt a compulsion to move closer. You gotta understand, I'm a 68 year old man. I don't get up unless it's to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Once I'm snug, you're lucky to get me up even if someone were breaking into my home. That said, in the blink of an eye, I remember suddenly finding myself in front of the mirror. It wasn't the woman's beauty that compelled me forward, though she was beautiful. It was more like a need on the deepest levels possible to follow her. I felt, if I did, all would be okay. I'd be young again. My aches and pains would go away and all my woes would be gone. For a moment, I swore I could step into the mirror if I'd want to. That said, just as I'm about to come closer, I was jolted by a phone call. My first thought it was, maybe that damn Irene from church always trying to get me to sign up for Sunday prayer meetings, even though I told her I'd spend more than enough time at church, especially on Sundays, and I didn't need to spend any more time in there. If God wants me in heaven now, he can take me during my morning coffee as easily as he could from the church. I'm certainly not in a hurry. That's neither here nor there though. It turned out to be a wrong number, and when I look back, the young lady in the mirror was gone. Speaking of church, when I finally did make my way there the following Sunday, I asked some of our congregation about this strange occurrence. Sadly, this only got me weird looks from just about everyone except for, ironically, Irene. She told me she had a similar experience and she believed this blue-haired woman to be an angel. Irene said she'd never felt such warmth from someone 
and I agreed at the time. That's the thing about time though. It's a tricky thing and it does change people and circumstances. As luck would have it, Irene said she'd been interrupted by her timer going off on some late night cookies when she was making. I began to question if this was lucky for us or if we'd missed some kind of rapture-like event. I'm an old man and I've seen some crazy, unexplainable things in my time. My questions would be at least somewhat answered two weeks later when Irene didn't show up for church service. I'm not sure if you've seen the news, but around that time Irene's family left her grandchildren with her that night before. As it turned out, when they went to check on Irene and pick up their kids, as well as get her up for church, they found, well, let's just say they found Irene at home, cooking, and no grandchildren. After a, a further search of the premises, they found Irene in a room, praying. She was asking where the grandchildren were, and answered that they were part of a meal for the family in celebration of God's angel coming to visit Irene. When later questioned by the police, Irene said she prepped the children as God's angel told her to, in order to appease God. This feast required she take part in it, as well as to which she gleefully pointed out, she ate as much as she could hold in. Now, I've known Irene for years, and while she is a bit weird, she'd never have done something like this under normal circumstances. She was a very loving, albeit an annoying woman, at times who had nothing but love for her family, until one Saturday night when it was proclaimed by an angel that she make a feast in God's honor. Irene also tended to keep a journal. The police found this journal at the dining room table full of sorts of lovely things about knitting, bingo night, church, and, oh yeah, the angel. The stuff about the angel all involves some sort of, uh, devilry about how to sew skin and being taught how to preserve meat and how to appease God. There were varying things about how to prepare for heaven, lessons about life, death, and happiness. Those usually involve six things I'd rather not mention. I've been sleeping with noise-canceling headphones and I've thrown out my mirror and blocked all the others in my house to be safe. You won't find old Winrick getting nabbed by some psycho angel. Nope, no way. There have been missing persons since, and most of those have vanished completely or been found dead. All of them seem to have one thing in common, the fact that they kept records of an angel that appeared to them in their mirror. Some wrote about it like psychos in their own blood in a journal or on a wall while others simply had files about it in their computers. I'm not sure if that means anything or what the reason is for it all, but I don't ever wish to find out myself. While that may be strange enough, I've also seen weird flowery petals raining from the sky every now and again. Experienced my fair share of weird knocks at 3 in the morning, part of why I also got the headphones, and even noticed a strange increase in ravens around the neighborhood. Take all that for what you will, and thank you for listening to my ramblings. There is something strange going on out there, something strange enough that I'm glad I'm on my way out of this long road we call life. Good night. Well, listeners... It is almost that time again. I find it fascinating, and also tragic, to see the strange things plaguing this area after the fire. It seems like it's gotten stranger than pre-fire around these parts. All that said, I'd like to wrap up the show with my final thoughts and then address where the roads will be taking us next. Tonight, we heard three tales of very odd things going around in this area. An area I might add already plagued by other sinister and strange happenings previously. What do you think is going on with the woods? How has it grown back at such an alarming rate? And is it something within to blame for the previous strange occurrences as of late? What might be most alarming is the eye. What does it mean? Why is it here? Why are so many people encountering it? Why are they disappearing or in some cases dying? How about the strange rose petals that sometimes rain down in town? Something I should note that wasn't mentioned in these interviews tonight was that some people were getting sick when outside while the petals are raining down. It isn't everyone, and we don't have enough evidence to suggest with certainty that the petals are the sole reason for it, but records from the hospital show that there is some kind of link between certain sick patients and the petals, even if slight. 
I suppose my final question of the night is, who is the woman in the mirror? Is she an angel serving a higher purpose? A ghost? A demon? What do you, the listener, believe her to be? Sadly, dear listener, that is all we have for you tonight. I'd like to thank those who I was able to interview tonight and also you, the listener. I and everyone here working on the Creep Factor podcast are grateful to you all for the kind messages you send and for your input on the show. Next episode, we are going to be heading over to Denver, Colorado to investigate a haunted park. Then, it's on to Canada, where some claim a creature lives and feeds on your mind. And we'll wrap that up with something exceptionally terrifying going on in Japan. Thank you all for listening once again. And this is John Billigan signing off. Have a great night.